In this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with Richard Armstrong. He's one of the nation's leading freelance copywriters. We talk about what worked and what won him one of the Capels Awards. We talked about what didn't work when he had a chance of a lifetime and it didn't work out. Also, we talk about one of his books and his strategy on crafts and a press release that nearly won him an Oscar, that and much more. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today I'm honored. We have Richard Armstrong. He's one of the titans of copywriting and direct response marketing. He's one of the nation's leading freelance copywriters specializing in publishing, membership, and fundraising. Richard is a two-time winner of the Capels Awards. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's the Oscars of Direct Mail. And he was voted the AWAI Copywriter of the Year in 2012. He's also the author of several books, including God Doesn't Shoot Craps, which is, which is intriguing. You have to pick it up. Richard, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Jeremy. It's an honor to be here. So, you know, I want to hear your big lessons, some of the mistakes you learned on your journey to success, what worked, what didn't work. And I always like to include a fun fact. Uh, fun fact about Richard is... Uh, he's interested in gambling, which we're going to get into, and horse racing. And he's also interested in aviation. I found that find, you know found this interesting, which you actually listen to the air traffic controllers. Yeah, I do. I, I actually have my scanner right here. And <laughs> what what the, the thing is, I'm right on the glide path here for the uh, departure. Well, it depends on which way the wind is blowing, but usually the departure comes comes right this way from National Airport. And it's right over my head where they switch off from air traffic controllers from the one at the airport to the one who controls the departure of all the flights. Yeah. So they, they call in right about as they're going over me and uh, to get their instructions about what altitude and what speed uh, to go uh, for the next uh, leg of the trip. And so I, I like, I have that on when I'm not doing any. I won't have it on when I'm riding or doing research, but if I'm just paying bills or something fairly mindless, I'll have that on and listen to it. Yeah. And, I, and I enjoy it because uh, uh, while a lot of it is uh, routine, in fact, 99% of it is routine, every now and then you'll hear something funny happen or uh, somebody will make a quip of some kind or, or the, occasionally there's a little problem that helps and uh, uh, the, the airplanes have gotten too uh, uh, tightly spaced or, or something and the, and the controllers have to kind of figure it out. And it's an interesting... Uh, mental exercise to to you yourself without the screen in front of you you know, you know I'm, I'm neither a pilot nor an air traffic controller but you can sort of picture what's going on up there and it's kind of an interesting intellectual exercise yeah. and you haven't found the the lost airplane yet so that's okay no i haven't yeah. i keep waiting for malaysian airlines to check in and, and <laughs> has anybody been looking for us we've been we've been lost for a few days but Richard, so I want to hear some of your best advice, but I want to first find out some of your influences, you know, early on. What would, would you know, what was some of the big influences for you growing up? Well, you know, probably uh, my biggest hero when I was a kid was uh, Muhammad Ali. Hmm. Uh, and he remains so to this day, really. And I think what I loved about him was that he talked a good game, but he backed it up. And... Uh, I remember very well back, you know, I'm, I'm 61 years old, so I remember before he won his first uh, championship fight. And uh, it, people don't remember this, most people don't remember this now, but we all thought he was just crazy. We thought either he was crazy or he was scared. Because Liston was just an incredibly uh, um, um, dominating sort of figure and frightening, you know. And, and we thought, well, this, this kid is so in over his head, he's so frightened that it's actually affecting him mentally. And that's why he's talking like this and everything. And I remember, I was too late to stay up to listen to the fight, but I remember my mother woke me up the next morning and she said, you'll never guess what happened last night. I said, what happened? She said, that crazy kid won. <laughs> and I loved him ever since then. I just followed him all the way. Where did you grow up? I grew up in rural, rural Maryland. 
Okay. Which is actually pretty close to where I am now. I live in Northwest uh, DC. I'm in the city now, but I grew up uh, on a farm out about 30 minutes from here in Maryland. Got it. And so what are some of the early influences on you to obviously that you took to being a copywriter? Well, that, that happened completely by accident. And I think if you talk with anybody of my generation, there are very few of us who actually sat down at age uh, 21 or 17 or whatever and decided, I want to be a direct mail copywriter. Right. <laughs> we all just kind of fell into it accidentally. What did and you want to be then? Oh, I wanted to be an actor. I definitely wanted to be an actor, and I took some steps in that direction. Although, as you can tell, I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of success. But I did get a, the kind of job that actors get to support themselves, which is I was working as kind of an office boy in what turned out to be a direct mail agency. And um, it was a sort of classic story where they, they needed to have something written. And uh, they were, you know, I remember an account executive was pulling his hair out because he couldn't write it and he couldn't find anyone else to write it. And I, my job was really to just kind of stuff envelopes and run out and get coffee for people in the office and, and lunch and so forth. So I was what, what's known as an office boy. But I did, you know, I was college educated and I had always been told by my college professors that I was a, a pretty good writer. Um, so I said, well, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. So he, he, it was an indication of how desperate he, this account executive was. <laughs> he let me do it. And I did right. it, and he liked it, and he showed it to his boss, and his boss liked it, and he showed it to the client. The client liked it. They wound up mailing it, and it wound up working. So the next thing I knew, I was a direct mail copywriter. Um, and, and it's kind of a funny story, actually, because not long after that, we had this kind of um, um, planning meeting. with It was a small office, but there were maybe 15 or 20 of us. And the boss of the whole place had a planning meeting of all the things we had coming up over the next couple of months. And every time there was a need for some copy, he would say, okay, now, Richard, we're going to need copy for that, and we're going to need copy for this, and we're going to need copy for the other thing. And I didn't realize that what I had done writing a direct mail letter was called copy. I actually thought that he meant he meant that I was going to be doing a lot of photocopying. <laughs> and I, when I heard that he meant that I, I had to write letters, I was actually relieved because I thought, oh, geez, I'm going to be spending my whole life with that photocopy. <laughs> so I stayed there for a couple of years and uh, actually uh, got to the point where they were calling me a creative director, uh, which meant that I had, I guess I had one person underneath me and occasional freelancers this is a small place, mm -hmm. but uh, then I was fired, and uh, and what? They, they, well, they didn't they didn't like the way that I kind of rolled into work at around ten or eleven in the morning, and and took long lunches that involved double martinis. <laughs> they they just they weren't they weren't thrilled with my my work ethic. How old uh, were you at the time? I was probably about. 24, 25, something like so that. So did your lunches really include double martinis? Oh, yeah. I was very much, that was the Mad Men era, you know. So I was I was very much into that aspect of the advertising business, the long lunches and everything. So, uh, but it, actually, you know, I was upset about it for about an hour. And then before long, I realized that it was the best thing I, that ever happened to me because I got out of the, out of the agency business couple of weeks later, they, you know, the, the, the very same company called me, brought me back in. They said, Richard, you know, we didn't like we didn't like the long lunches. We didn't like the fact that you never were here, but we really did like your copy. So what we'd like you to do is is work for us on a freelance basis. So I I wound up signing my previous employer as my first client. And there's a tremendous mental shift that takes place, I think, um, when you go from working for somebody else to working for yourself. You suddenly start to take it a lot more seriously, and you, you have a greater interest in it, and uh, you're more assiduous about it, and uh, that really made all the difference for me. And gradually, although I was still kind of interested in pursuing acting at the time, I actually moved to New York to do that. Hmm. I found that as time went on, I became more and more interested in what I was doing to support myself than I was in, you know, carting my little picture and resume around to agents every day, which is pretty tedious. So how did you get clients besides the one that you worked for? 
Uh, I think it was mostly uh, by reputation. I mean, uh, there's a lot of sharing that goes on in our business. And so people would ask my other client, uh, my first client, you know, who wrote this for you? Uh, uh, and they tell them uh, they were actually, um, that client was responsible for getting me a very nice gig in New York that wound up uh, getting in, me into a whole other area of writing. Uh, I got hired as a um, publicity writer for ABC, the uh, television network. Oh. And that was a time when they were just beginning to get involved with uh, cable and other uh, videos and other kinds of, at the time, were new, relatively new technologies. Yeah. Um, and uh, they were very understaffed when it came to their, uh, well, they were understaffed in generally in general, but especially when it came to their publicity efforts. So here I was a freelancer and suddenly I was doing rather significant things like writing speeches for the, for the top executives and so on and so forth. And it was a, that was a great period. And it taught me the public relations business, taught me about speech writing, um, taught me about uh, press release writing, a lot of things I wouldn't have otherwise learned. And in the meantime, I was still getting direct mail clients as well. Uh, mm -hmm. It, mostly by referral. I, I did very little in the way of self-promotion. Um, it I just took whatever uh, came my way. Um, but I, you know, uh, when you have a success, word gets around. Yeah. Wouldn't they yeah. want to keep you as their secret weapon? Why would they want to tell everyone else? Well, there have been copywriters I know of over the years who have been kept as secret weapons. I know that Boardroom had a guy by the name of Mel Martin, for example. And Marty Edelston at Boardroom would never would never reveal his name. Um, you know, he never... I did talk to Brian Kurtz. I did oh, interview did. Brian. Yeah, did Brian tell you that story? No, he didn't. No. Well, they, they, the, he was the guy who you know what a fascination is, Jeremy. No, explain it. Well, it's it's a it's a technique that virtually every copywriter uh, uses nowadays. It's a very short little headline that just kind of uh, captures somebody cur somebody's curiosity. And it's usually used to sell a book or a magazine. And so it'll say something like, uh, would you like to cure malignant melanoma, melanoma with eating an orange? See page two. <laughs> yes. Now in our business, we call that fascinations. Right. This guy, Mel Martin, actually invented the fascination. I mean, that's an indication of how uh, talented and creative he was that he came up with this whole new way of writing copy and uh, he was working for boardroom all those years to get back to your original point and boardroom never told anybody else about him they kept him a secret right. but I I was not a secret I guess I wasn't valuable enough to be kept a secret but occasionally you have a success or, or I won some awards back in those days and that gets you a lot of publicity um, uh, one, one way or another, your, your, your name gets passed from client to client. Right. And I never had to really do a lot of overt promotion. So tell me about some of those early successes of why they were, people were requesting you almost. What was in the, those, uh, campaigns? I think, uh, one of the biggest, uh, uh, ones that I had in terms of making a difference in my career was one that I wrote for the Sea Turtle Rescue Fund. Um, which was uh, uh, about, um, it was a fundraising package to try to get people in Florida to turn, to turn off their lights at night because lights distract sea turtles when they're hatching. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote, uh, a, a, you know, in all humility, I would say a very interesting and a very good piece for them. And it wound up winning all sorts of awards, including what at the time was probably still is the biggest award, which, which would be the, the best in show at the, at the Capels Awards. And, uh, you know, this gets written up in the trade papers and whatnot. And the next thing you know, people are calling you out of nowhere to, to hire you. So that, that made a big difference in my career. But I think any time you have a winner, I mean, one, one thing that's, that I think is, is good about the direct mail business and, it's generally true, despite the Mel Martin story that I told you. Most people are willing to share information, even with their competitors. Um, we're not we're not as tight lipped as a lot of industries are, mm -hmm. um, and so it's not unusual for uh, a client to see a package in his own mail. And if he happens to know that client, he'll call that client. He says, "I was really impressed with that. Who wrote that for you?" And they'll, you know, ninety nine times out of a hundred, they'll tell you. 
they'll tell that person who wrote it. And mm -hmm. so your name mm -hmm. just kind of gets, you know, passed around in the right circles. And before you know it, you have more business than you know what to do with. What was in that sea turtle campaign? That seems like a strange, strange way to make a mark. You know, probably I should tell, should uh, give your listeners uh, a, a, um, a, a website that they can go to. It's my own website. It's mm -hmm. uh, www.freesamplebook.com. And in that, I have all of the kind of major um, successes and failures that I've had throughout my career. And I wrote a little bit about each one of them because there's usually kind of a story behind them. Or if not a story, there's, there's a little bit of an analysis of why I think something won or why I think I thought it lost. Um, and so I think it makes very interesting reading and people have, have told me that it does. I've, I've, it's been downloaded probably something close to, uh, five or 10,000 times now. So a lot of people have read it and I, I think it's pretty good and pretty instructive. Um, so yeah, that's freesamplebook.com. Go there and there's no, uh, as the name implies, there's no it's charge. Free, yeah. So uh, at any rate, I think the reason was that we actually, I, I came up with the idea of putting an illustration of what is happening with those sea turtles on the letter. Now, what happens is sea turtles, when they're first born, uh, they, are instinct they know instinctively that the way to get from the beach to the ocean is to follow the light. Because in, you know, going back millions of years, and it's still true today in areas where there's, where, where there's no civilization, the area over the ocean will generally be somewhat lighter than the area over the land because the ocean reflects light from the moon and the right. stars back into the sky. So the, the sea turtle hatchlings know that as soon as they get out of their sand, out of that sand, their job is to head towards that light as quickly as possible. But if you've got a McDonald's or a Burger King or Donald Trump's house or something like that on the beach, and it's all lit up like a, my, my parents used to say, a Polish cathedral, no offense to the Polish people out there, then the sea turtle gets very distracted. You know, I go, which way should I go? Right, right. So he heads in the wrong direction, and then once he heads in the wrong direction, he's pretty much screwed. He's going to die because his life depends on getting to that ocean really quickly. Otherwise, right. it's going to be eaten by predators, crabs, or foxes, or what have you, or run over by a car. So... The whole idea of the piece was to, to raise money to buy advertisements in Florida to tell people to turn off their lights at night during a sea turtle hatchling season. But what I did that was different was that I put a picture of all those sea turtles and uh, uh, how the, the vast majority of them were heading towards the ocean. That was right on the first page of the letter. But then I showed one little sea turtle who went the wrong way and he kind of he, he, you could see his footsteps as they went through the letter and around the subheadlines and through the paragraphs and everything. So it was almost like a little movie that was playing out in front of you while you were reading the direct mail letter. And that was really different. It was really, um, uh, in, uh, you know, I hate to use these words talking about myself, but there, it was ingenious. Um, it was clever. And it was the kind of thing that, you know, does really well in awards. Now, sometimes the kind of thing that does well in award ceremonies doesn't do very well in the mail. But this was one of those occasions when it did well in both. It was successful in the mail, and it was also successful when it came to winning awards. So, um, um, you know, that just got a huge amount of publicity at the time. And, and for I was just, the, you know, the toast of the town for a little while. <laughs> so how do they measure that? The success of it, they go to the beach and measure how many lights shut off, or what do they do? Oh, the actual success, yeah. I don't know how it's measured, really, to tell you the truth, except to say in a general way that people are much more sensitive to this issue now than they used to be 20 years ago when I wrote this. So there's no question that people understand it now, and they didn't. I Nowadays in Florida, a lot of people are aware of it, and they will turn off the lights. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that's in, in the zeitgeist. People, people really know about it. At that time, it was a completely new idea. Uh, but w the way we measure success in direct mail is much more simple and, and mathematical, and that is we simply count the, re the, the money that comes in. Right. 
Uh, and it was successful in that regard. And uh, from a direct per- male person standpoint, that's really that's really what you're concerned about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Richard, what was another success that you're proud of? Oh, well, let's see. Um, I had a major, major success with uh, uh, with Rodale. Rodale was one of the most important uh, clients of my career. Uh, they're the publishers of Prevention Magazine and many, many other Men's magazines. Health, I think. Men's Health, yeah. right. Um, and uh, I had a huge success for them for a book called The Sugar Solution, which was a book about diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and how to avoid it, how to reverse it. And um, it, it was just a uh, blockbuster success. And again, I think in both cases, what we're talking about, if you want to find kind of some kind of a, uh, a common thread between those two things, was that they were very, both, both packages were very story driven. I was telling a story. Right. And um, that is, if I have a strength as a copywriter, that's it. That's what I'm particularly good at. As you mentioned, I've written a novel. Um, so I, I, I just seem to have some kind of a knack for that. There are other aspects of copywriting that I'm not so good at. And I see the work of some of my colleagues and some of their headlines and things that they do very well. And I just think, Oh God, I wish, I wish I could do that. I just don't, I don't have that ability, but, but if I do have a strong point, it is that I'm very good at telling stories. So what was it that you were able to create with that? Was it the sugar solution? Well, I actually just told a story about being uh, on vacation with a friend of mine who was extremely overweight. He's a really close friend, but he's always, and until recently, uh, he's been, you know, just morbidly obese. And, uh, you know, I never really thought he ate all that much, but I, I didn't live with him, so I didn't know. But we went to, one day we went to Las Vegas together, and I saw how he ate. And it was very interesting. I'd get up and I'd say, you want to go to breakfast? And he'd say, no, I don't, I don't eat breakfast. I'm trying to lose weight. And I'd go, all right. And then, you know, four or five hours later, I'd say, let's get some lunch. And he'd say, no, no, I, I don't eat lunch. I'm trying to lose weight. And I thought, okay, I'm getting kind of hungry here. But I'm getting, that's the way you want to be. You know? So finally, we'd go to dinner, you know, and he'd sit down to dinner and he would order everything on the menu. <laughs> I mean, and in Vegas, that's what you, you can do that. Exactly. And this is and what I learned from reading the sugar solution, the book, is that this is absolutely the worst way to eat if you want to lose weight. Because what it does is that it causes your blood sugar to spike, which causes your body to your body is thinking, My God, I didn't eat breakfast, I didn't eat lunch, I must be starving. So when you finally do get some food, your body thinks, God, I better store that food as fat because I might starve. I might go back to starving tomorrow, you know, so I store it. So that's absolutely the worst way to eat uh, if you if you want to lose weight. So I simply told that story. You know, I disguise it. I, I put it in a woman's voice rather than a man's. First of all, to protect the privacy of my friend, but also because I knew that I was mostly writing to women and not to men. Um, so I just kind of told that story about that revelation that I had. And then I, you know, wove in a lot about the book and what the book was talking about. And I think I also, again, you know, it's hard to have an interview like this, Jeremy, without sounding terribly egotistic. Well, we'll get to some of the failures too, don't worry. (laughs) But I think I did a particularly good job of doing some, something that's very difficult. And that is explaining what diabetes is. Diabetes is a very complicated disease to understand. I think everybody has a very good understanding of what a heart attack is all about, what causes it. I think they have a reasonably good understanding of what cancer is and what causes that and what happens to your body when you get cancer. But diabetes involves a lot of very subtle, complicated things that are going on, and people just have a tendency to, you know, it's so complicated for them. They don't take it as seriously. Yeah, Yeah. they don't take it seriously, number one. They don't realize how bad it can be. But number two, they can't really picture it in their minds. And I think I did a very good job in that piece of explaining exactly how it starts, exactly how it works on your body, and exactly how it will wind up if you don't do something about it. Right. Um, And uh, I just just made that extremely clear using metaphors and analogies and, and similes and so forth. And I think as a result, it really 
people hit home and, and realize, God, if I don't do something about the way I'm eating right now, I could die a lot younger than I'd like to. Yeah. <laughs> it was just a huge success for Rodale. And somebody at Rodale said, actually said to me, I don't know if they were you know, being tongue in cheek or not, but they said, Richard, thank you for saving all of our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't have many successes like that, but that was certainly one of the, one, one of the big ones. And again, it's like we're talking about, Jeremy. Um, you know, I know you mentioned Brian Kurtz. Brian was talking with people at Rodale, and um, this was years later, and the thing was still mailing because it was so successful. And Brian finally uh, was saying, was talking to somebody over there, I don't know, Pat Kopor or somebody like that, and said, who the hell wrote that sugar solution piece for you, man? I mean, that's been mailing forever. They said, well, Richard Armstrong wrote that. And Brian, Brian knew me a little bit by reputation, but we'd never worked together before. So he said, I I've got to hire Richard Armstrong. So I wound up working for Boardroom for the next four or five years and ha have had, they've really replaced Rodale as being my biggest client now. Wow. <laughs> that's the way things work. Right. So and I don't want to overlook this. It's not like you sat down your first draft and you just came up with this award-winning mailer. What was your process? I'm sure it wasn't the first thing you put down on the page. No. Well, I'll tell you, if there's one thing I've learned about um, o over the years from where I was when I was working for that agency as a 24-year-old, 25-year-old versus where I am now is the importance of the research that you put into it before you write a single word. Mm -hmm. Back in those days, I would usually have a stack of research in front of me and I'd sit down and I'd start working through it until I get my until I had my first good idea, which would usually happen within the first 5 or 10 minutes. And then I'd go, "Hey, that's a good idea." And I'd immediately start going to the typewriter and start writing it. Mm -hmm. Um and and try to wing, basically try to wing it based on that one good idea. What I've learned over the years, I still get a big stack of research, but I've learned over the years not to trust that first good idea. It may turn out to be something that you'll use, but chances are you'll find something much better later on down in that stack. <laughs> maybe even after you've gotten to the bottom of the stack. Yeah. Um, maybe after you've gotten to the bottom of the stack, you still haven't found it, and you have to go to the library, you have to talk with other people, you have to do other things. But I find it's kind of like the reverse of garbage in, garbage out. It's gold in, gold out. The more, the more good quality information and research that you can put into your head, and the longer you can sit with that process and be comfortable with it and not feel like you need to get going on writing um, and wait for that really great idea to hit you. And also, not only the big idea, but to have all the proof elements and the the um, statistics and the facts and the the support uh, information that you need to kind of put a structure underneath that idea, which all comes from that research, um, you've got to go through that process. So you get, you've really got to be spending, I don't know, 10 or 20 times more time uh, in the research phase than you are in the writing phase. And I didn't realize that when I was 23 years old, but I do now, and that's probably made all the difference between where I am now and where I was then. So how long did it take you to come up with that end product? Uh, you mean how long did it take me to learn that lesson? No, for the sugar piece. How long did it take you to, to come up with the end product? Well, I think by the time I was writing the Sugar Shalusen piece, which was maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I was well acquainted with the importance of research. And in the case of a book, most of your research will come from the book itself. But it's not just a matter of reading the book like you're reading a novel or something. You're reading the book so carefully, if you're doing it right, you're reading it so carefully that by the time you're finished with it, you know it as well and possibly better than the author does it. I'm <laughs> does. You're reading it word for word, sentence by sentence, and taking notice, taking note of virtually all of it. I mean, my notes when I'm reading a book will be something on the order of 100 to 150 pages of wow. type notes. It's and longer than the book itself sometimes. Yes, yeah, sometimes it is because what you're looking for, remember when we were talking about fascinations? You're looking for those tiny little tidbits 
that you can turn into something that will be useful in the copy. And there's no shortcut to doing this. It has to be done the hard way, and it just takes hours and hours. And it's actually very tedious, even if the book is good. And, you know, I'm with Rodale in Boardroom. Usually the books quite, are quite good, I think, anyway. Um, but it's, it's still extremely tedious work, and I can usually only stand to do it about uh, two or three hours every day. Um, because it just, after that, you just want to slit your throat, you know, because it's just, um, uh, it, it's just such excruciating detail sort of work, right. but that's, that's the kind of, uh, plowing that you've got to do if you want to reap the reward afterwards. Right. Right. So I would say by the time I was working on that sugar solution, uh, package in the nineties, I had learned that research lesson very well, and I probably spent, I probably took six weeks to do the project and at least three or four of them on reading the book yeah. and the ancillary research, which would have been reading um, whatever additional information they gave me, whatever I could find on my own about diabetes, about blood sugar. Uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll run to uh, Amazon. I don't recall if we had an Amazon back in that particular time, but I back in those days I'd go to the either the library or bookstore, buy four or five other books about diabetes, uh, look through them. Um, and uh, so I, I just can't I can't emphasize enough how important that research phase is. Mm -hmm. And to tell you the truth, I'm not as avid about it as some of my colleagues are. I mean and and they're more successful than I am. There's a guy by the name of Mike Palmer, for example, works for Agora. He's maybe one of the best copywriters out there right yeah. now. Uh, I reached I, out to Mike as well. Oh, have yes. you? Yes. Well, I've heard him describe his research process, and it might it makes me look like a piker. You know, I mean, he he'll sit down there and read half the library before he decides that you know that he he's found the right way to approach something. Uh, I always feel a little more pressured to get going at some point, and in part, it's because I'm tightly scheduled. I know, and and I'm 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 very. Um, determined about meeting deadlines because I think it's one of the things that my clients like working about with me, uh, working with me. Um, and I know that there are a lot of copywriters out there that don't feel that way and they drive their clients crazy. So I figured this is one of the things that I can give to my client is that I can be on time. So I, I, I do feel somewhat pressured by scheduling. And at a certain point, I'll just say, you know, I got to give it up at this point and start writing. But Palmer, bless his heart, I mean, he'll, he'll spend a year researching something before he writes it. On the other hand, because he works for Agora and because of the royalty schedules they have there and the way that the way they're so aggressive about marketing and how they, they compensate their copywriters, it's not unusual for Mike Palmer to make a million dollars for a promotion. Wow. So, you know, if he, if he spent a year researching, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's well worth it. Good use of his time. Yeah. I haven't heard back from him yet, but I'm, I'm still on. Well, keep pursuing that, yeah. uh, Jeremy, because I really, you know, if you talk, there are some great copywriters who are retired, like Gary Bensabenga, uh, Clayton Makepeace is, I think is on the verge of retirement, but I put him, I put Mike Palmer right, up yeah. there and he's still working so i if i were in your situation and trying to interview the top people i'd he'd be very high on my yeah. list both of those people i did reach out to also so did, did you get that yeah. get won't do interviews with anybody. no he said you know i don't even do this he was very nice very nice in the response and he just said my best friends i won't do uh interview or seminar with so i can't say yes to you and well, if, uh, it makes, if it makes it if it makes you feel any better yeah. i will tell you in confidence, even though people are listening, I won't give the principles, but I know of one client that offered him a hundred thousand dollars to do a one day seminar and he turned it down. So when Gary says he's retired, he really means he's retired. Yeah. Yeah. And Clayton, you know, I mean Clayton just did his own seminar that probably brought him around a half a million dollars based on what he was charging wow. and how many people I assume he got. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, he's not easy to get either. <laughs> yeah. I, I won't stop. I won't uh, stop pursuing Clayton until they said, you know, lay off. But um. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe when Clayton does actually retire, although it, I, I didn't think Gary would really retire, but apparently he has. 
Uh, he he has one little uh, business that he does on the side, but I don't know how much he sp- how much time he spends on that. But I, Clayton is such a workaholic. I don't know him very well personally. I've I've shaken his hand. That's about it. But uh, uh, he's such a workaholic. I I it's hard to imagine that he that he really will retire. But maybe when he does, maybe he'll be available for interviews. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think it's it's just for me. I just picture it as like a disservice to this series. To not have people like that, or at least for me to not pursue it, you know, to its maximum. Yeah. Um, and, and for you, you know, Richard, you're a humble guy. And I want to bring up one more successful campaign before we get into maybe sure. an unsuccessful one. Um, and there's one I had noted down, which is an unbeatable control for American Sellers Wine Club. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you talk yeah. about that? Well, that, in fact, uh, we're talking about Gary Bensabenga, and that's uh, he really played an important role in that because one of the things that I learned from Gary, this has kind of been one of the key principles of the, the approach that he's taken to copywriting, is that he tries to make his advertising itself something valuable. So that when you get a piece from Gary Bensabenga in the mail, you don't think, oh, another piece of junk mail, throw it out. You think, oh, this is interesting. And this is, this is something that I could really use. I should read this because I could, you know, put aside that it may be selling me something. It's something that I really want to uh, consume. It's educational also. Exactly. So um, I had learned that from Gary. And shortly after I did learn it from Gary, I decided to apply it to a client of mine, which was a Wine of the Month Club. And they had done... For years, their control had been a conventional direct mail package written by Richard Potter, who is an excellent, excellent copywriter out of Southern California, keeps an extremely low profile to the point where a lot of people don't even know his name. But here's a guy who charges at least, I think he charges around $40,000 a package and is booked up from now until doomsday. So, I mean, he is he is a superb copywriter. Um and he wrote just a beautiful piece for them that had been a control for at least seven or eight years by the time I took it on. Uh, but it was a conventional mailing package. I mean, it was, we want to invite you to join this wine, wine of the Month Club, and here are all the wonderful wines we're going to give you. And uh, here are the reasons why you'll save money on these wines and everything. But it, and, it, and it was very flattering of the customer. And it, does, it did everything right. It was just a great piece. I thought to myself, how the hell am I going to beat this thing? Which is what I think every time. Because I'm always impressed with, with what I'm seeing that my colleagues have done. I tend to be working at a fairly high level, you know, so the people I'm, I'm working against are the top copywriters. And I, every time I see what the control is, I go, oh, no, how am I going to do this? But I thought, well, what, what if I tried what Ben Sabanga said? What if I try to send the, uh, send the customer something that he or she, as a wine aficionado, would just find interesting in and of itself. So I came up with the idea of sending a handbook to wines. And it was all about how to store your wine, how to buy wine, how to order wine at a restaurant, all very valuable, interesting, useful information if you were interested in wine. And in the middle of it, kind of woven in very subtly in sidebars and and illustrations and photos, I just gradually kind of wove in a pitch for joining the club. <laughs> so um, uh, it, it really turned out to be quite successful. It knocked off this fabulous control, and it lasted as a control for a number of more years, at least four or five years. I haven't, I haven't spoken with that client recently, and I, haven't, I used to be on their seat or their, what we call their decoy list, so I could see, I could see it coming. Uh, and I haven't seen it in a while. So that either means that it was beaten or they've just decided to give it a rest, which sometimes, you know, a client will do. But uh, it, it it was really, I would count that as one of the big successes of my career. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I want to get that one thing that I learned from Gary. That's what I want to emphasize is make your advertising valuable. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is valuable. What about, and I want to talk about like when you talked about some of the failures and some of the weaknesses, which you said when you see other people, you're just amazed with. But first, I want to talk about one of your strengths, which is story. How do you craft a story? What's your, do you have a structure? What do you do? 
Well, absolutely. And in fact, there's no secret to this. It was worked out by Aristotle 2,500 years ago. <laughs> he basically said, and all stories, all good stories have pretty much followed this template ever since, is that you've got to start with a hero, what he called a protagonist. And that hero has got to want something. He's got to have a goal. He's got to have something that he wants. But he can't just get it. There are a th series of things that are standing in his way. Now, those may be villains or antagonists. They may be people that are trying to stop him. Or they may just be circumstances. They may be obstacles that he's facing. But somehow there is something that is keeping that hero from attaining that goal. Um, and you take, you take the hero through the process of overcoming those obstacles and defeating those villains until he reaches the point where he attains the goal. Now, the trick, it, that, that, and that's the way you write a novel, it's the way you write a television script, it's the way you write a movie script, it's the way any kind of uh, story is done. The trick of doing it in direct mail is that you've got to do it in such a way that the real hero either overtly or subtly, the real hero of the story is the customer. And you're talking about the goal that that customer wants to attain. And you're talking about all the obstacles or villains that are standing in the way of the customer. And the role that your product plays is, if we go back to the idea of classical, classical structure here, classical Greek structure, is what's known as the deus ex machina, which is that thing that comes in from out of nowhere. It actually means an act of God, I think, or something like that. Deus ex machina, a machine, machinery of God. It's some divine intervention that comes in and solves all, the, all those problems and defeats all those enemies and allows the hero to reach his goal. So your, your hero is the customer. The goal is what he wants out of life. And the deus ex machina is your product. So you write, you write it according to that structure. Mm -hmm. And if you do it right, there's no, there's no better way to write a direct mail piece. I mean, if you look at the, the most classic direct mail or, or direct response piece in history, it was uh, John Capel's uh, They Laughed When I Sat Down at the Piano. And it follows that, it follows that template very closely. Um, the, uh, another really, really famous one down through the years is the one written for the Wall Street Journal that started out one sunny spring morning 20 years ago, two young men graduated from college. Um, follows the same format. So um, it's, really, it's really no mystery how to do it. The, the difficult part is doing it well. And some of that is a gift and some of that, I think, you can work on with practice and you get better at it. Uh, but I think it's, it's true that some people do have a natural gift for telling stories. And I, I think I do, have, I do have that gift to some degree. As I say before, there are other aspects of copywriting that I'm not as good at. And, uh, and it bothers me, and, and I've tried to improve over the years. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, like, like Clayton can just rip off these headlines that grab you by the throat. You know, it's like they, it's like they force you to buy because they're just so so compelling and so emotional and everything. And I don't I don't really have that in my arsenal, but I am a good storyteller. So, what other weaknesses? You said headlines. What else do you think that you don't <laughs> do well? Well, I I'd have to say that my biggest weakness all overall is just laziness you know i i'm 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 just i'm i'm kind of a fundamentally lazy person i don't work very long during the day maybe three or four hours i don't do all the things that i should have done uh like i have to this day i i don't believe i've read i've read all of the classic direct mail books i've read some of them maybe even most of them but i haven't read all of them I know that I haven't completely worked my way through Robert Collier's letter book, for example. And there are others out there that I haven't completely read. Um, one of the great pieces of advice that they, they give to young people in our business nowadays is to sit down and hand copy a successful direct mail package. I've never done that. Um, so there's all sorts of good advice that I've never taken over the years because I've been too lazy. I don't have a very good swipe file, for example. 
One of my mentors in this business, maybe we'll talk about this later. I know you're going to ask me. No, about go ahead. It, was uh, Milt Pierce, uh, a great copywriter, and I took a course from him. Um, and uh, Milt had a swipe file that was so big. He was kind of a messy person anyway. But when you went into his office, it was like, it was like going into the Library of Congress af after a hurricane had gone through. <laughs> I mean, there were direct mail samples as far as the eye could see. And he'd made quite an effort to categorize, categorize them and put them in filing cabinets and things like that. But there were still tens of thousands of others that hadn't been filed yet. You know, I mean, it was like he was like he was some kind of a hoarder or something. <laughs> and, uh, and I really have never kept much of a swipe file at all. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, making some terrible confessions to you because this is all really good advice for copywriters that I've never followed because I'm just too damn lazy. So I think if I had to, uh, if I had to put uh, my finger on the biggest problem that I have is laziness. And that goes to the research, too. Again, I, I do not have the kind of whatever it is, the drive, stick to itiveness. Uh, discipline to put in the kind of research that Mike Palmer puts in. And that's why I don't make a million dollars from my packages like he does, you know? So I, I, I can't make any complaints. We are what we are, you know, yeah. but, and I've tried to overcome it to some degree, but I think uh, there is a, there, you can't over every, overcome every aspect of your character. For sure. And, and there's some there's some that you can only overcome to to some point. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on on the plus side of that, I, I think I have superb work life balance. Um, I'm I I'm not a workaholic. I enjoy my life. Um, you know, many afternoons I spend taking off, uh, going to the golf course, or doing whatever I feel like doing. I love to take long lunches that with can martinis you <laughs> two or three hours you know what good know. advice have you taken i mean like are you going to be here for the rest of your life <laughs> so, so i i do enjoy my life but uh and 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 there's more to my life than than just work and all that is positive but you, you got to take the good with the bad yeah so what good advice have you taken that you found has been most valuable you said there's well, obviously listed a lot that you haven't but i'm sure you've taken a lot of good advice too well, to go back to Mill Pierce, you know, I took this course uh, in the early 80s, and I had actually been a direct mail copywriter going back to 76 or so. And I remember when I took the course, I'd actually won a Cables Award or something like that. And some of my friends said, what, what are you taking a copywriting course for? I said, well, you know, there's, there's always more to learn. Plus, it was the first one I'd ever seen that was offered by, it was offered by New York University. And Milt was a major copywriter, and I thought, you know, you know, I don't know everything. I should take it. Yeah. Uh, and you know who who turned up to be in that class with me? Only because I watched your your oh, your talk. But go, yeah. I'll let you. Bob Bly was in the class. Yeah. And I actually had more experience than Bob did at that time, a little more because I was older. Um, that's one of the secrets that people don't know about Bob is that he's a lot younger. <laughs> He's, yeah, he's about 10 years younger than I am. He's only accomplished about 100 times more in his life than I am. But uh, anyway, here, here the two of us were in that, in that same class together. And, but Milk taught me something very important. Uh, that turned, and people have different feelings about this. Everybody has their own way of doing things. But I always wrote out copy, handwritten, um, on a yellow pad and did it very, very slowly and very, very laboriously. And I told Milt that. In fact, I submitted some of my homework assignments handwritten because I, I could just barely type. Um, I was trying to teach myself to type and I wasn't very good at it. And Milt took me aside. He said, you've got to learn to type. You've got to be a good typist. And I'll tell you why, because you want to write as fast as you can. You want to be able to write as fast as you can think. You don't want to be writing things longhand. And I took that to heart. It's one of the few occasions where I did take advice and really worked at it. I worked hard at becoming a good typist. Nowadays, I like to say that typing and parallel parking are the two things that I do best in life. I'm, an, I'm a superb typist. But the point is, as Milt said, you want to type as fast as you can think because you want to get all those ideas out there, all, all, that, all the copy that occurs to you, all the way of phrasing things. Just get it out there as fast as you can, 
then you can take many, many hours or days or weeks later to refine it, edit it, cut the bad stuff, emphasize the good stuff, all the things that you do in the editing process. But to be able to write fast is critical. Now, having said that, I know there's still some great copywriters out there who are big believers in long handwriting. Um, I can't think of uh, one's name, but I just heard one the other day, somebody that I respect a lot. I can't remember who it was, but they still do the long hand. So, you know, it's it's uh, each to his own to some degree, but I really believe that Milt was right about it. And uh, when I think of advice that was given to me by other people, that, that really comes back uh, yeah. to being an important one. Yeah, Richard, I know you mentioned Bob Bly, and anyone should watch that. There's a video on YouTube with the AWAI and when you won Copyright of the Year, and he kind of yeah. introduces you, and you're talking. There's some good stories um, there. But what uh, have you learned from him as a colleague and mentor? Oh, well, Bob, what I really admire about Bob, aside from his work habits, which are the precise opposite of mine, you know, I just talked about how lazy I am. Bob is the hardest working person that I have ever met. Um, he, he must put in 16 hour days. Uh, and uh, he also, when I've, when I've gotten to where I want to be on a particular project, whether I'm in the research phase or the writing phase, if I'm in, if I'm writing a, if I'm writing a book, for example, I may set a, a goal of writing five pages for that day or 10 pages. When I reach that goal, I say, I've done it. I'm, all, I'm finished for the day. I go out to lunch. I go to the golf course. Okay. Bob says, okay, I've reached that goal. Now I'm going to write 10 pages for my other book. <laughs> or I'm going to write on the direct mail package that I'm working on right now. Or I'm going to, you know, create a new website or something like that. He does that all day long. I don't know when he sleeps. So he's, he's absolutely amazing in that regard. And, and, uh, I'd like to say he was a role model, but I just, I just, I can't, I, I can't do that. Where he has been a role model to some degree, though, is in his writing style. The thing that I really love about Bob's writing style is that it's completely transparent. You have almost no sense of there being a writer there. And now, if they're, if they're, um, literary writers who are listening to this, poets or, or novelists or what have you, people or English majors, they'll think, well, that's terrible. You want to have a voice. You want to have a style. But Bob has no voice. He has no style. <laughs> he simply... He that's simply a compliment? Acts, yes, no, it is a compliment good. because he simply acts as kind of like a conduit, a medium between the customer on the one hand and the benefits of the product on the other. You don't notice anybody trying to sell you something. You don't notice anybody writing. You're not, you're not drawn to the style at all of the writing at all. You're not, you're not distracted by the writing. You're only thinking, Oh gee, I'd really like to buy that thing. <laughs> you know, is there an example that sticks I, out to you? No, I can't really think he, he almost, he almost does it every day, every day that I see a promotion from him. You, ne you never stop and think, God, that was really well written. That was really clever. Bob is really smart the, the way he wrote that. You just think, oh, man, I really need that thing. And I buy Bob stuff all the time. I buy his reports and things like that. And I do it all the time. And every time he sends me an email, it says, Richard, how long have we known each other? You can have this. <laughs> just let me know. We don't have to go through this whole rigmarole. But I just, I, I still, I can't stop. I click on it. I got to buy, you know. <laughs> and, and that's what, that's what he's so great at. Um, and, and it's funny. I think he has that to a larger degree than anybody. Because I can tell when I'm reading something from Clayton. I can tell when I'm reading something from Gary. Um, there are a number of others. Um, to go back a number of years, there was a great copywriter by the name of Bill Jamie, you could always tell when you were reading something from Bill Jamie. I mean, he had he had style and voice to the nth degree. But with Bob, it's just like Bob's not there. It's just you and the product. Yeah, it's you and your desire, and uh, that's uh, that's amazing. Which is I mean, kind of what you were saying with the story structure, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it is. Uh, you get so lost in it that you you're not really aware that you're being sold. Yeah. Yeah. 
What's one of the campaigns that didn't do well that you thought? Oh, well, now we have a very wide choice of things to talk about. <laughs> because, well, you know, one of the things about this business, and, and I think if there are young people who are listening to this, they should always remember this. We fail much more often than we succeed in this business. It's uh, the analogy that I sometimes use is, is baseball. I mean, if, 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 you get, if you get a hit one out of every four times you come up to bat, you're a major league baseball player. If you get one out of every three times you come up to bat, you're probably just about the best person in the whole league. Yeah, and you're a Hall of Famer. Yeah. Than that, you're the best person in history. So you fail more often than you succeed. And that's very true in our business. I mean, you know, I'm, if I do 10 packages in a year um, and two or three of them turn out to be successes, I've had a pretty good year. But that also means that I'm looking at seven of them that I failed. And that's hard to hear over and over again. You call the client. How did it do? Well, I'm sorry to tell you, it bummed. You hear that over and over and over again. And that, you know, that takes a toll on you because each one, you never intend to bomb. You always think that they're going to be huge successes. Right. And in many places, the client thinks it's going to be a huge success too. They're all excited about it. Everybody's excited about it. You get the results back, it bombed. And it's very hard to hear that over and over again. Um, so I'm just saying that to people out there who may be getting discouraged uh, who by, by lack of success, the success will come, and it doesn't take that many successes to have a successful career. If you have one or two a year, or if you have one really big one every now and then where everybody knows about it, that can make all the difference. Yeah. Now, having said that, to look at a particular one, there was one that I always come back to because it was so it was such a great opportunity for me, and I blew it. I really I started out in the fundraising area, and I really wanted to make a transition into magazine promotion because that's where the big money was, and that's where all the really talented people were. And it was also a glamorous field to be in, to be selling you know, Playboy and Vanity Fair and then New Yorker and everything. It was, it was, it was, you know, uh, the, the, the most glamorous area of the business. And so I always had this goal that I wanted to make the transition into that area. And one day I got an opportunity to work for Dick Benson. Now, Dick Benson, I don't know if you know that name, but he was the top consultant in the area of magazine circulation. He knew everybody, all all those magazines that I just mentioned had him as their main direct mail consultant. There was nobody more tied in than him. So to get a winning package from him would have meant that I would have been instantly in that crowd. So it was the biggest opportunity I ever got in my life. And he hired me to write for one of his own publications because in addition to being a consultant, he also owned two of them. One of them was called the Berkeley Wellness Letter. It was a newsletter on health. And, uh, and the other one was called Health After 50 from Johns Hopkins. He made gazillions of dollars on this. I mean, he didn't even have to do the consulting if he didn't want to. It was a, The newsletters were enormously successful. How did he find you? He found me again because of that, uh, I think, basically because of that Sea Turtle Rescue Fund thing. It just, uh, you know, my name was out there in the, in the trade publications of having won that big award and everything. So he found me that way, and he called me, and uh, he wanted me to hire me, and um, I wrote a package for the Berkeley Wellness Letter, and I decided to focus on Winston Churchill, because Winston Churchill lived to be, I think, or almost 90 years old, around 89, 88, something like that, and he had the worst lifestyle, health style, lifestyle of anybody imaginable. He drank like a fifth of liquor a day. He smoked cigars like crazy. He stayed up all night and got a few hours of sleep. And here he lived so long, you know. So I thought, why don't we base the package on that? We had a picture of Winston Churchill out on the front of it. And it said, Winston Churchill, you know, drank every day, he smoked like this. He, he, he burned the candle at both ends, and yet he still lived to be 89. How did he pull it off? I thought, wow, that is a really great headline, a really great idea. It'll get people into the letter. It'll do beautifully. Now, Dick, when he read this, he loved it. And I mean, he loved it. And 
Dick Benson was a very undemonstrative person. He was the kind of person who, when he called you, he never said hello. He'd just start talking to you. And then when he was done, he'd stop. He'd never say goodbye. I mean, he was just a very flat line sort of individual. Uh, but he was gushing, absolutely gushing. And he called everybody he knew. This is before it mailed. He called everybody he knew. And he said, I've discovered the most amazing new copywriter. This guy is the next Bill Jamie. I want to read you some of his copy. So, so I mean, it was, it was amazing. It was like all my dreams had come true. Well, time goes by couple of weeks, couple of months, however long it took, I got a call, not even from Dick. I got a call from one of his assistants. He said, remember the Winston Churchill package you wrote for the, for the wellness letter? I said, of course I remembered. He said, well, it bombed. <laughs> Click. <laughs> and they hung up? Yeah. And that was it. That was it. I never heard from him again. So it was the biggest opportunity that I ever had in my life. And I blew it. And when I, and I still to this day, I try to figure out, well, what, why exactly, what exactly went wrong there? Mm. I think I just kind of got my eye off the ball by focusing on Winston Churchill and particularly by putting a big picture of him on the outer envelope. I think most people probably looked at that and thought that we're trying to sell history books, you know, or something like that. Something to do with Winston Churchill. They probably never even read the headline. Didn't realize that it had something to do with health. And more to the point, didn't realize that it had something to do with their own health, which would have been the right way to approach it. So I just sort of, you know, I, in a sense, I took my eye off the ball and, and I got too creative, too clever, too cute, um, too imaginative, instead of focusing on who the customer was, what the customer wanted and what I could give to them. Right. Uh, I just got distracted from that which is a mistake that is very, very common. And it's a hard mistake not to make. I mean, not, that's not the only time I've done it. In fact, if I look back on the major failures that I've had in my career, it's over and over again I've done the same thing. I've tried to get creative, clever, imaginative. And in the process, I got too far away from what I was really selling. Yeah. So um, I, I keep going back to that one, even though I've had, I could tell you about thousands of failures I've had over the years. That's the one that made the most difference to me because it had, I had the chance to really attain one of my life's, one of my career's greatest goals. I mean, it was there right for me and I lost it. Yeah. Uh, and I lost it by doing something kind of stupid. Yeah. It's those game winning shots that we play in our mind over and exactly. over and over. It's the Michael Jordan thing. I had the chance to win the game with the last shot and I missed it. But as Michael Jordan will point out, and you've probably seen this quote before, he missed a lot of game winning shots himself. Yeah. So, you know, I had other chances and I eventually did get back into the magazine promotion business. And uh and so I eventually did attain that goal. And and Ironically, in retrospect, the magazine promotion business nowadays is nowheresville. Uh, for a lot of reasons, magazines in general are struggling, and they just don't promote in the mail like they used to. So uh, the people who did specialize in that area, if they weren't able to adapt to the changing realities and the changing uh, nature of our business, uh, they're kind of screwed. And some of those people actually wound up retiring early because of it. So what are the, mag the magazine days then? What is equivalent to now? What do people aspire to write for or do? The internet, I would say, definitely. Um, um, the, most of the, I'm, well, I can't say most of it, but a lot of the direct marketing business has gone over to the internet. And that's that's where all of the action will be in the future. Uh, the, the format that is the real killer right now is the video sales letter. Sure. Um, are you familiar with that? Yes. Uh, it's... Um, for those people who are listening who may not be, it's basically uh, a uh, you click on a link and what you see is kind of what I describe as a rolling PowerPoint. Uh, it's a long text message uh, where you see the words and you hear a voiceover. Um, but it's basically a direct mail letter that is being read to you uh, over the Internet. That is the hottest format that's out there right now. It's working a great in in all sorts of areas including a lot of areas where people thought it would not work they said people thought oh, this is not quite right for me and they tried it and they went wow <laughs> you know it just you know doubled and tripled their results so 
I've written several of those at this point. Um, and uh, are you when you write one of those? Are you sworn to? Oh, I was just going to say that you know I'm at I'm at the tail end of my career, not at the beginning of it. So there's I still have a lot of direct mail work that's left over from other customers. But I think I think this this is a this is a great time to be getting into this business and to be focusing on the the internet side of it. Anyway, I was going to say, are you sworn to secrecy with those things, or can you say, oh my work is on this website, or how does that work? Ah. Uh, I'm just trying to think of one that I I wrote one recently that I just heard turned out to be a big winner, but I think it's too early to tell you that I wrote it. And it was also wrote in somebody else's voice. Uh, and I don't want to betray that confidence. Yeah, that's fine. I don't edit so, these, so I don't want you to uh, say yeah. anything. What was the genre of? It was a, a business promotion. So, or what do they call it? Business opportunity sort of thing. Okay. Um, uh, I wrote uh, a video series. So, uh, yeah, I wrote one that was successful that I can tell you about for Dr. Uh, Furman for Boardroom, um, uh, where he was uh, selling one of his products. Uh, he, he sells uh, diet books. Uh, that, that's been relatively uh, successful. But uh, this, this is a, a comparatively new thing for me. I mean, I, I'm a direct mail guy. I, I am making the transition to the Internet uh, and have done a few of these BSLs. I have done a few uh, websites and a few emails, but it's still a comparatively small part of my business. If I were younger, I would be much more engaged with this than I am. Mm -hmm. But I pretty much have enough direct mail work to last me for the rest of my career in terms of uh, clients that I already have. Uh, so I'm not, you know, I'm not that eager to make the transition. Mm -hmm. I do know one, again, I'll, I'll let this be anonymous because it's probably not something that I should name somebody, but I know one great copywriter who really just, when, when the internet started to become so big, he just decided to hang it up. You know, he decided to retire because he didn't want to learn any of the new things that he had to learn. But um, what do you do differently with the video sales letter? Well, it really isn't that much. And that's why I was kind of surprised by his decision, because I, I personally didn't agree with it. I didn't think there's there's that much to learn. There's some technical things you've got to learn. Um, but um, um, it's really essentially the same. I mean, God, you're really just writing a direct mail letter. Yeah. But we get we get so uh, we get so. Um, used to writing in the formats that we're writing in that sometimes when we're asked to change formats it becomes rather difficult uh just because we're we're in kind of a routine or a rut i mean i've been writing magalogs for about 20 years now that's my metier and uh when i'm asked to do even a conventional direct mail letter like i would have done 30 years ago i i it's kind of it's kind of a strong shift for me because i'm I'm so used to thinking in terms of Magalogs. So I can kind of understand that being uh, the internet transition being difficult. But you're right. I mean, the basic skills, the fundamental skills are, are exactly the same. Yeah. And I want to see also, you know, I want to transition and talk about your book for a second. Sure. And what inspired you to write God Doesn't Shoot Craps? And I want to know how you came up with that title. Um. There were a variety of inspirations, uh, but the main one goes back to my friend Bob Bly again. Um, he, Bob, one of the things that Bob does to promote his business, and again, where he finds the time to do this, I don't know, but he reads a lot. He reads very widely. Um, for example, his, he re, he's told me, he's told, he's told, Everybody, he's, he's, it's been in his newsletters and everything, that he reads the New York Review of Books from cover to cover every, I think it comes out twice a month, which is amazing because that's incredibly dense reading. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, because he did it, I subscribed to it, and I finally said, Bob, I can't handle this. I can read the New Yorker. That's as good as I get. I, I cannot handle the New York Review of Books. I mean, it's so, it's so intellectual. But one of the things that he reads is um, um, uh, Practical Science. Is it called Practical Science? Yeah, well, it's, it's a science magazine. He probably reads several of them. He probably reads that and Science and Nature and a few others. I mean, he, he reads very, very broadly. But anyway, one of the things that he does to promote his business 
in a very, very subtle way is that with all this reading he does, every time he encounters an article that would be of interest to any one of his friends or clients, he clips it for them, he puts FYI for your information, and signs it blah. So it says FYI blah. And he hands it to his assistant, and he says, send it to whomever. And over the years, I've probably gotten like 20 of these from him. And But he knows that I'm interested in gambling, and he sent me one that literally changed my life. It came from practical science, and it was about a, a gaming theory, mathematical gaming theory. And a guy by the name of Juan Perando, in, uh, who is a professor in Spain, in Madrid, who's an expert on gaming theory, had come up with a, a mathematical theory that was designed to take two, two gambling games that lose that are designed to lose, just the way all casino games are designed to lose, uh, and combine them in a particular way that you would get if you combine, you played one for a while, then played the other, then played that, the first one, then went back to the other. If you combine them in that way, you could get a winning result. And I just went, wow. <laughs> That's and really this is in the book, and this is in, your, is. in the actual well, book. Tell you, Jeremy, my first thought was, why don't I develop a crap system based on this and sell it, you know, through direct mail? It would be great. And then I thought, well, Perandu himself had said, look, for a variety of mathematical reasons that are too complicated for you and I to get in right now, but for all these reasons, this does not work in a casino. So I would, in a sense, be selling a fraudulent project, a product if I did that. So I decided, no, nah, I, I, I don't want to wind up in jail. I won't do that. But then I, th my second thought was, well, what if somebody did do this? If I wrote a story about somebody who did, who was a direct mail guy, and he did write a, a, a craps piece based on this system, and he sold it. What if I could tell a story about that and write a novel? Now I had never had any interest in creative writing in my entire life. I'd never written a novel. I'd never written a short story. I'd never written a poem or, or ever really had any interest, interest in it. I wasn't an English major. I was an art major. So, um, I, but for the first time I thought, well, you know, I could do this. I could write a novel based on this idea. And the essence of the novel is that the, the, the guy is a direct mail con man and he sells this system and he just kind of assumes that it won't, that it doesn't really work, but he doesn't care because he's a con man. He'll sell it. But he figures he better go to the casino to check it out because a lot of times when he sold things like this in the past, people have called him up and said, how does this work? How does that work and everything? So he better at least try it out in a casino so that he can be, you know, fluent with it. So he goes to the casino and it works. And he's, he's more shocked than anybody. He had no idea that it would work. And then uh, the next thing you know, it falls into the hands of the mafia and the mafia figures. Well, I don't want you to give too much away because okay. I, I haven't finished it. So, <laughs> and I'll I plan on it. A bit more. The mafia figures, well, we've got this now and we don't want anybody else to have it. So we got to bump him off. We got to get rid of him. So, you know, complications ensue from there. But the thing that I think is interesting about it um, from our standpoint today is that it's, I believe it's the only book that's ever been written about the direct mail business. The only novel that's ever been written about the direct mail business. And um, it, it also involves this mathematical theory, Perando's paradox, which kind of goes back to what we were talking about before in terms of failure and success. Because the idea behind Perando's paradox is that you lose and 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 you, lose and you turn out a winner at the end. <laughs> and that's the way the theory works. And it's really the way life works. The theory works on the basis of a, a, a ratchet, basically. A ratchet is a device that allows movement in one direction, but not in the other. Like elevators, were, they, elevators were not practical until Otis came up with the ratchet idea so that they could go up freely or down freely, but if they ever fell, they're caught by a ratchet. So a, la a ratchet allows movement in one direction, but not in the other direction. So what that means is that if you fail and you fail and you fail and fail, and then you have a, a little success, 
And then you fail and you fail and you fail and you fail. Then you have another little success. It's interesting that your successes work for you, but your failures do not really work against you. People remember your successes. They don't really remember your failures. And to go back to Winston Churchill, our friend from that direct mail package, when, greatest quote ever, Winston Churchill said, the secret of success in life is to go from failure to failure without losing your enthusiasm. Isn't that great? And that's really the truth. Because everybody fails more often they, than they succeed. But the thing that they don't realize is that your failures don't really count. It's only your successes that count. People remember the successes. They forget about the failures. They forget about all the times Babe Ruth struck out. They forget about all the times that Michael Jackson, uh, Michael John, what's his name? Jordan. Yeah. Michael Jordan uh, missed the winning shot. They only remember the really Im the times that they really came through. And that works in the direct mail as a direct mail copywriter. It works in any business. Right. And that's why you shouldn't get too discouraged by your failures. The only the only time you're not achieving something is when you're not doing anything at all. Yeah. So why God doesn't shoot craps is the title. <laughs> well, it also this this theory also has to deal with quantum mechanics. Um, because it, it's related to how quantum mechanics works. And God doesn't shoot craps is a, is a famous uh, quote from, uh, from Einstein when he first heard about quantum mechanics. Because Einstein worked out the theory of relativity and everything, but he'd done all, all that when he was a relatively young man. And yeah. physics kind of moved ahead of him. Um, and they got into the quantum theory and what's going on in subatomic particles and everything. And Einstein was keeping up with that. But he wasn't really making the big discoveries that some of the, his other colleagues were. And he kind of resisted it. And when, when Heisen, I think it was Heisenberg, came up with the idea that most of this movement was completely random, that in effect there was no way to predict it, Einstein got angry and he said, God does not shoot dice with the universe. Because Einstein truly believed that there should be a way to figure these things out, that it was not random. He had a philosophical opposition to the idea that it was random. Mm. And I think you have to uh, read the book to see how this all weaves in. But it does, it does deal with Pirano's paradox, and it does deal in, in a weird kind of way with direct mail, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> and so my next obvious question is, so what's your crap strategy? <laughs> well, you know, having to told you about this elaborate crap strategy, Mine is really very simple. Uh, I just I, I play the pass line with full odds, mm -hmm. and then I place the uh, six and the eight, okay. um, and uh, and I try to keep uh, three numbers uh, those th basically those three numbers running uh, uh, at all times, uh, and then the main thing that I do uh, is that I I try to remember that winning streaks don't last forever, um, so I don't. I think the biggest mistake that people make at craps or any other gambling game is that they don't know when to leave. Um, the, the, the winning strategy, the, the most important winning strategy that you have, and it's a very simple thing, everybody knows it, is to quit while you're ahead. But people have a hard time doing that. They have a hard time emotionally doing that. And one of the ways to, to make sure that you remember to do that is, is the way I put it is don't expect to have more than one hot roll in any given session. Mm -hmm. So I'll play until there's one really great, good hot roll where I make money, and then I'll leave after that. Mm -hmm. So knowing when to leave is crucially important, and also knowing that eventually that seven will come up. So you've got to take your profits off at some point. Right. So I'll, with the place bets, I'll, I'll go through this progression. On the first win on a place bet, I'll go same bet. On the second win on a place bet, I'll go um, uh, press. Okay, so I'll, I'll double it. Got it. On the third win on a place bet, I'll take it down. You say take it down. I take the entire thing down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And most craps players will not do that. They'll just leave it up there. And as a result, they'll eventually lose everything they have. Yeah. Uh, or they'll press. Uh, there are a lot of guys, you know, these big players who think, you know, they're flashy and they throw around a lot of money. They just press and press and press and press 
and eventually they lose everything you put down there. Right. So you got to take your profits every now and then. So that's right. that's an important part of my strategy too. And and I'm I think I'm actually a pretty good player in the sense that I I tend to win more often than I lose, but it tends to be small amounts. Um, so I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, pretend that I'm a great gambler in the sense that I've beat the casino or anything. Right. You know, a friend of mine wrote a great book about, uh, about casino comps. It's called whale hunting in the desert. Okay. Uh, and, um, he, he told me, and it's in this book, he said, the thing about, uh, comps that the uh, casino host realize is that, uh, big players, they have a tendency to um <laughs> this is kind of vulgar i'll try to clean it up they they eat like a minnow but they defecate like an elephant <laughs> which means that they are happy with very small wins but when they lose they lose really big <laughs> and that's what casino hosts take advantage of there's there's sort of a psych psychology that they're happy to to take a, take a small win but when they when they lose, they usually lose a lot of money, and uh, and so uh, you, um, I try to avoid doing that. But I am happy with those little wins. Yeah, I always like hearing other people's crap strategies. So because craps is really the only. Can you tell me yours? Yeah, so it's actually somewhat similar to yours, actually. But I think on my twenty first birthday, I took a plane over, and I didn't know how to play craps, but I always wanted to because it looks like there's a lot of action there. So I just read a book on the flight from Chicago to Vegas. Uh -huh. And one of the strategies, there's a bunch of strategies in the book, which you know, in for people who know craps, you know, it's really statistically out of all the table games, it gives you the closest odds to the house. Yeah, with the uh, um, pos well, of course, uh, blackjack, if you're counting cards, um, which be, I don't know how to do. So yeah, and uh, yeah, neither do I. And I think uh, Baccarat betting for the banker gets you fairly close to uh, to the craps odds. But yeah, generally craps uh, with full odds is the best. Yes. So that's what I do. Like, kind of what you said. Just I try and have, you know pass line, and then you know because what gives you the most odds on the or closest odds to the house is your backup bet to the pass exactly. line. Exactly. The odds bet. Yeah. Yeah. So pass line, and I was talking with David Garfinkel, which I'm surprised you haven't taught him how to play craps yet. But, no, I didn't know David was a player. I he's not. Up between the two of us. He, he's not. But uh, oh, okay. we were talking about you and then your crafts book, and then it came I, up. And and so the pass line, backing it up, and then a come bet, and then backing that up, right. and then a come bet. So I try and have three so have numbers working, yeah. Three numbers working, but the majority of my money behind the, the come bet or the pass line. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's an excellent way to do it. Yeah. And uh, – in Las Vegas, if you go to Las Vegas, you hardly see this outside of Las Vegas. But in Las Vegas, where you've got a, a very competitive situation, you've got dozens of casinos and everybody's looking for some way to differentiate themselves, you'll often find that they'll offer very, very generous odds on the back. See, yes. even to the point where sometimes you see 100 to 1 odds on the yes. back. If you can put a dollar on the line, yes. $100 behind the line, that is the absolute best gambling game that you can get. Right. I mean, it's actually almost a fair game. You you have to consider, gee, the casino deserves some money for putting a roof over your head and giving you a drink and everything. So, um, so if you can see that game, uh, I mean, if you can find that kind of game, definitely play it. The problem is that you it's it's still no defense against losing. You'll right. still occasionally right. lose. Yes. You gotta be prepared to lose those hundred dollar chips and not everybody is comfortable with that. Yes. You, like you said, <laughs> it, like, I like your strategy. If it's a hot roll, then just get out. You know Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Don't expect more than one hot roll in a session. That's that's my uh watch for it. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know, I appreciate that. So I like hearing your your philosophy also. <laughs> and I wanna hear, Richard, too, what's um just overall What's a big lesson you've learned in your career? Because you've had a lot of campaigns. Um, and I want to hear one big lesson and then kind of your best advice for copywriters out there, or people writing their copy. Is it okay if I mention two things we've already talked yeah. about? The two biggest things that I've learned, and we've already gone into great detail, so I'll be brief. One is the more time you put into the research, the better you're going to do. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the opposite of garbage in, garbage out. It's gold in, gold out. So if you're spending 10 to 1 research versus writing, that's a good indication. If you can make it 100 to 1, 
it's going to be even better. So that's one thing. The other thing we also touched on, on, don't be creative. Don't be cute. Don't be clever. Just be fundamentally strong. Uh, If I had a nickel for every time I've been beaten in a direct mail test because I came up with some wild idea that was really creative, really ingenious, really clever, and the client loved it. The client said, oh, my God, this is a world beater. And I was beaten by somebody who came up with something that you've seen a million times before, like a membership card, for example, or, I, I don't know, a token, a free token or something like that. Things that you've seen so many times, you'd say, how could this possibly still work? But it does. So I, I would say those are probably the two biggest lessons that I've learned throughout my career and that have been the hardest to learn because to some degree I'm still learning them. I mean, there's still there's still a kind of instinct every time I start a project to go for that home run with the big wild imaginative idea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to tell you the truth, Jeremy, I probably won't ever give on it, give up on it completely because those are where the big breakthroughs do come from. I mean, yeah. there had to be the guy who came up with the first Magalog, for example. Yeah. So for people who don't know what a Magalog is. First video sales letter. Yeah. What, you know, for people so who don't know about the Magalog, explain what that is. Oh, um, that's a self-mailing direct mail piece that uh, looks, when you get it in the mail, you think that it's a magazine. Your first inclination is that it's a magazine and not something that's selling you a magazine Mm -hmm. or selling you a book or selling you a newsletter. Um, And uh, it works because it's kind of like a Trojan horse. Uh, We kind of touched on this with the wine uh, project. Um, You think, oh, this is an interesting piece. It's about investing. And uh, there's some good tips in here, and there's, you know, this, it's well worth reading. And you almost don't realize that while you're reading it, you're being sold. This was probably the single biggest innovation that I've seen in my career during my period on, in this business, and it was not my innovation. As a matter of fact, when I first saw one, I thought, my God, this will never work. <laughs> because, because I thought... My, my first thought was it would be too expensive versus a conventional Yeah, that's, I would think that too. Yeah, but the truth is, and this is interesting, and this is why you've got to learn about other aspects of the business besides copywriting, uh, it's actually much less expensive. And the reason is because it doesn't, has all, it doesn't have all those different pieces. It's the self-mailer. So if you're t- if particularly if you're talking about economies of scale when you're ma- mailing in large quantities, it actually winds up being less expensive than a conventional mail piece. So I didn't realize that. My first reaction was negative, and I kind of stayed away from it. Uh, I wasn't interested in doing them, but eventually I just had to yield because that they were the ones that were winning. So I got into Magalogs, and then I, I've been riding them ever since, and that was something like 20 years ago. And yet I know a few copywriters out there, really good copywriters, who never did make that transition? So you've got to be you got to be somewhat ad- adaptable because otherwise history is just going to roll over you like a steamroller. Yeah. Uh, the, I have to give some credit where credit is due. I know the guy who invented the uh, the uh, first uh, Magalog. Um, uh, this this is the difficulty with getting to be sixty years old, Jeremy. It's not coming to me. But he's an artist who worked for Phillips Publishing. Um, and uh, he and Jim Rutz was the copywriter, uh, one of one of the great copywriters of that time. I, I don't think he's still active, but they were the ones who came up with the idea. Of, why don't we Why don't we make our promotion look like Ed Elliott was his name. Ed Elliott was the artist. Ed Elliott and Jim Rutz. They were the first ones to come up with the idea. of Phillips Publishing of making their promotion look like a magazine rather than like a direct mail piece. And then a man by the name of Gary Bensavenga was the first person to really take note of it. And he kind of became like uh, Mozart to their Salieri. I mean, he took it to a whole nother level and uh, just had enormous successes with it. Yeah. I think it was Gary who invented what we now call the book log where you get something in the mail that looks like a book not a magazine. You, you physically, it looks like a book. And um, he did one for Rodale. I think, I believe it was called The Doctor's Book of Home Remedies. I bought and, that. Did you? Oh, for sure. Well, Gary, I'll, 
I'll give you some idea of how much money Gary made from this. I was, I was chatting with Pat Corporo once, uh, who was the head of Rodale Books, and he told me that I once, he said, I once wrote a check to Gary for two and a half million dollars. Wow. And that was one royalty check, one out of dozens or more than that. That was a great book. So, <laughs> yeah, it really was. So anyway, I mean, when you talk about a copywriter making tens of millions for, from a single direct mail piece, you know, you're dealing with a very, very powerful uh, medium. And it was, uh, you know, it was relatively new at that time. We're talking about 10, 15 or 15 or more years ago now. Um, and people got this thing in the mail. They thought, oh, this is a little book of home remedies. And so they'd look up gout. They'd look up, uh, they'd look up arthritis. They'd look up headaches. And they'd get part of the answer. They wouldn't get the whole answer. But they'd get what we talked about earlier, a fascination. They'd get part of the answer. But to get the whole answer, they'd have to send for the free book. And, uh, I mean, it just... It just revolutionized the business and it made Gary, you know, wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice because he was on a royalty. He was on a royalty deal. Gary was also kind of one of the leaders in our business and direct mail business of getting compensated by royalty rather than by direct, uh, you know, straight payment mm -hmm. and uh, worked out very well for him, obviously. <laughs> And was that book a free book or was that a paid book? Was that, uh... well, it was a free book. It was, okay. Well, well. What people received in the mail was a book log. That's absolutely free, okay? But what it was selling was a real book that was, that was paid. But you didn't have to buy it. It was a free trial offer. You only had to send for the book. And um, you, uh, the, the standard Rodale offer was um, 30 days, 30 days free. So you could get the book. And you could, uh, if, if you were of a mind to, you could look up the things you were interested in and send it back and not owe anything. And a lot of people do that. You know, Tim, maybe, I, I'm not privy to those numbers, but I would guess they would probably average somewhere between 10 and 15% of the people send it back. But it doesn't matter because they're making money on the other 85%. In fact, Gary, Gary used to tell this funny story about his, uh, I think it was his aunt who uh, announced at a, at a Thanksgiving dinner, I think he said, Gary's going to be very mad at me. And they said, well, well why is Gary going to be mad at me? Well, I got one of his things in the mail, and I sent for the book. But I didn't pay for the book. I sent it back. I'm going to get Gary in trouble. <laughs> well, believe me, Gary wasn't in any trouble. <laughs> Gary was making out pretty well. <laughs> they were, and Gary was making out pretty well, too. So. <laughs> when I was younger, that was my prized possession. I mean, I remember paging through that because I was into like natural remedies for some reason, even from a young kid. Yeah. And I would page through that thing. It was actually very informative. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's the trick with book logs and mag logs is how to how do you how do you draw that line between free content and content that you're reserving for an order? Yeah. Uh, and um, in the Magalog business, we generally think in terms of roughly 50-50 or maybe 60-40 on the free side. Uh, in the Internet business, you've got to be even more generous. You've got to give away most information, and uh, it's more like 90-10 yeah. uh, because uh, people will, won't give you as much time on the Internet. Uh, so you buy, you got to be providing a lot of free. And food. you're not having to pay to mail something to someone either. It's, you know, yeah. you put it up on a site, it's yeah. free. You know, you're talking, there's expenses involved with sending something. Yeah. You know, come to think of it, I will skip ahead to your next question, which you previewed by saying what, what would be another piece of advice that I would give. In addition to the two things that I mentioned, I would say learn about other aspects of the business, not just about copyright. Because I think that's one thing that many copywriters... Now, I had the advantage of working for an agency, starting out with an agency. And even though I took those long martini lunches, and even though I showed up for work around 10 or 11 in the morning, I wasn't entirely stupid. And I did learn a few things by osmosis about what the other people in the agency were doing. So I learned a little bit about list, list business. I learned a little bit about production, about letter shop, about printing. 
all these things play an important role because this business is it, the the creative side of it, the, the copy side of it is only you know a third of the business at, of it. maybe maybe it's more like 10% of the best the rest of it is really mathematics it's putting together together a good offer and making sure that the mathematics of the author were, of the offer work out correctly so that you can give away a lot and yet still make a profit so that you can mail a lot and still and lose money on those mailings and yet still make money on the back end when you go to them a second time it's all very sophisticated arithmetic or mathematics that you've got to work out and copywriters are just mostly blissfully unaware of this stuff but they shouldn't be they, because they the more they know about it the more they can help engineer a real breakthrough and then there's the list business i mean the list business is incredibly important that that has also gotten extremely complicated in the last 10 or 20 years where we're talking about list segmentation and overlays and regression analysis, all stuff that that I truthfully I just barely understand. I, I understand it well enough to be conversant with it. But the more you can understand that, the better the more valuable you're going to be to your to your clients too. Uh, we usually think of a of a mailing as being built on a three legged stool where you've got um, uh, the creative is one, the list is the other, and the offer is the third. Now Interestingly enough, the creative is the least important of these three in terms of results. The, the, the list and the offer are the most important. By far, it's not even, it's not even close. For, and, and I'll tell you, you know, give you a simple analogy to drive that home. If you were selling fishing lures, for example, to a list of people who had contributed to the Democratic Party, it's not going to work. Right. <laughs> you know? It makes no sense. You get a zero <laughs> response, okay? So the list is probably the most dramatic difference is getting the right list. The second thing is giving them the right offer, which we talked about. The third, and by far the least important, is the creative. But the reason that the, we put so much attention on the creative is the creative is the one that you can work with most easily. It's the one you can influence. It's the one you can test and change and and it's also the least expensive to work with, uh, even though people like me charge a lot of money and people like Gary Bensavanga charge a lot more. It's still the least expensive aspect of it. Yeah. So it's the one that you can tinker around with, play with, change, change with, and occasionally get significant results with. But it is not usually the most important thing. And uh, as a result, copywriters, my advice to young copywriters would be to learn about those other aspects of the business particularly the list and the offer, because if, if you can come up with a change in the offer, the, you'll get dramatic changes in results. And sometimes, as a copywriter, we can change the offer, even though we're not allowed to change the actual offer in terms of the numbers of it, we can change the way we express the offer. For example, instead of saying, well, the classic example is is instead of saying 50% off, you say buy one, get two free, okay? That is that is like the difference between a light, be, as Mark Twain said, the difference between lightning and lightning bug, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's a huge difference. And all it is is a slight difference in the way we express the offer. Uh, so the offer the offer that's being made has, has an enormous effect on results. And copywriters should be more conversant with this than they are. Yeah. You see that if you go to the grocery store, that's what you see all day long. I mean, you see buy one, get two free. Yeah, yeah. I mean, offer, offer and list are, are really the critical things. Um, and so as copywriters, the extent that we understand those two things and not remain blissfully ignorant of them, uh, it's going to make a big difference. The, uh, not only understanding the offer, but the list, too. We've got to understand who those people are out there that we're talking to. Yeah. Um, for example, you could simply take the step of seeing what the uh, what what the data what the data rate card looks like on the list, and and uh, those are the you know the, the the statistical facts about the audience that you're writing to. Yeah. Most most copywriters will never take this step; they'll just kind of work in a vacuum, and uh, and either they're ignorant of all these things, or they've never taken the time to learn them, 
or, or, or they made a philosophical mistake in thinking that it's all about creativity when it's not. Yeah. And Richard, I want to find out what you're working on now, where people can go to find out more. But first I have to ask, so have you thought about your book and turning it into a movie? I mean, when you're talking about this, I'm thinking I could see you, like you always wanted to be in, in the movies. I could see you being the, like the, <laughs> the pit boss. And you have, you have like Robert De Niro there. and, and so he... Well, I have to tell you, Jeremy, it's actually been optioned for the movies by uh, uh, producers of, um, um, do you remember a Broadway show uh, uh, four or five years ago called Xanadu? No, but my wife would know that. <laughs> well, ask her about it. It was, a, it was a pretty successful Broadway hit. And the producers were two young guys and they wanted to get into the, movie business, uh, um, in addition to Broadway. And so they bought the option on God doesn't shoot crabs. And it was, it was great. You know, I mean, it, it, there was not a lot of money involved, but there was some, and, but they invited me up to New York and they wined and dined me and they gave me free tickets to their Broadway show. And I, you know, I was in heaven. Uh, but, um, they, they own the option, but they've never done anything with it. And I've noticed now that you mention it, I've noticed they haven't, they're supposed to pay me every six months. And I've noticed that they haven't paid in a while, which means that they've kind of let it lapse. So it is available. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the thing about the, the reality about this business is that there are something on the order of 50 to 100,000 novels produced every year. Um, many, many thousands of them are optioned every year. And only about, I think, in terms of major Hollywood feature films, only about I, th I think somewhere between 50 and 100 are made every year. So that's the mathematics yeah. of it. Um, there are really, really big, successful, hugely famous, wealthy novelists who've never had their films made into, novel into movies. I mean, never had their novels made into yeah. movies. So the chances that mine would ever get made into a movie yeah. uh, are really extremely remote. But I, I, was, I was thrilled to just have it optioned. And I actually made more money from the option than I did from the publisher on that book. So it, Hollywood, in that sense, was good to me. Yeah. <laughs> I can't I, explain. But yes, from your lips to God's ears. I, I could see that. So if anyone watching, you know, turns books into movies or whatever the case is, I can, and the stipulation is they have to put you in the movie as a pit boss or something like that. Well, I would love yeah. to do it. Well, yeah. I got to tell you one quick story. Yeah. Uh, you said you've read the first uh, few pages of it? I've, yeah, I've read the first, like, 50 pages. Well, you, you may remember that at one point in describing the main character, rather than getting into a lot of detail about how he looks, I said he looked like the movie actor Dennis Farina. Uh, do you remember that? Yes, yes. So I thought, what the hell? I'll send it to Dennis Farina, you know? So I did. I, in fact, I'd read something somewhere on the Internet. I'd read that he'd started his own film production company. And I thought, well, you know, there just might be a chance that he'd be interested in it. So I wrapped it up in a little package and I wrote a, wrote a letter and I sent it off to Hollywood, sent it to his new production company. And sure enough, he called me. He said, let's talk about this. So I had lunch with him. He, he came to Washington. I had lunch with Dennis Farina. <laughs> and it was fabulous. You know, people were coming up asking for his autograph and everything. And I was like in heaven because I'd, I'd always been kind of a fan of his. I, you know, he's, he's Italian and he's very glamorous looking and dresses beautifully and everything. And, and I, I always, he was always kind of a, a favorite of mine. So that was, that was one of the great days of my life was heck, taking lunch as they say in Hollywood. With so who, for people who don't know Dennis Farina, who tell, tell people. Oh, well, what, what's the biggest thing that he did? Well, he was, he was on law and order for a long time. Pretty much any time in a, in the movies where they needed somebody to play a mob boss, it, he would be one of the ones who would be considered for it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the most famous movie that he had. Maybe Midnight Run might have been the most famous movie that I he mean, had. I mean, because you sent it to him, but like in the book, basically the part is he's getting approached by prostitutes. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he wants... He I don't know if he liked that or didn't like that, but no, he, he 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 loved the book and he wanted to do it. But truthfully, I don't you know I don't think he ever produced anything. He was he was making money as an actor, and I think that was just he was kind of taking a flyer at being a producer. Yeah. 
Yeah. There, you go to Hollywood, there are an awful lot of people who have hung out their shingles as a producer who either produce nothing or not very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Richard, I have one last question for you. I appreciate your time. Um, but before I ask it, tell people where they can find you. I know you mentioned a website. What are you working on currently? Well, um, the website to go to is, is www.freesamplebook.com. And as I said, that's where I sell this, or not sell, I give away this uh, book that I have titled My First 40 Years in Junk Mail. And it really is basically just going through some of the highlights of my career and the lowlights. I decided, well, we'll throw in the fa failures too. Yeah. And I talk about, you know, why I think something succeeded or why it didn't. And occasionally there have been some interesting stories to tell on, uh, along the lines of people that I've met and people that I've worked with in the direct mail business. So... Uh, I think it's an interesting thing to to get and and um, and I, I almost never mail my mailing list, so you don't have to worry about uh, being bombarded with emails afterwards either. Uh, in terms of what I'm working on now, I'm actually on a little bit of a creative hiatus. Um, I I took uh, the first part of this year off. Um, I, I I I had a huge success last year with something that I did have on a royalty. Uh, from, uh, I guess I can tell you this, Agora. And uh, they sent me a check that was like, ah, ah. <laughs> and I thought, you know, if you're ever going to take a little time off, Richard, it might be now. <laughs> so I, I ha haven't really worked for the past couple of months. And um, I'm gradually uh, getting back into it. Uh, so I, I'll probably uh, go back to my clients and uh, pretty soon and tell them I'm ready to uh, start working again. Um, I'm also thinking about writing another book, um, a book, uh, this would be a book about advertising. It would be about some of the things that we've, uh, discussed today in terms of technique and sort of my philosophy and, and approach. Uh, but I haven't, uh, I haven't done much about it yet. I've mostly just kind of enjoyed my time off so far. Yeah. So, uh, so the answer is that I'm letting, leaving, living the life of a playboy and a bum, at least for the time being. Or you could say that I'm semi-retired. Semi-retired. Well, that sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> so, Richard, my last question is this. And in my research, I try and do a lot of research too. Um, I found something, and I, I was really curious to ask you about it, which it said, a press release that nearly won an Oscar. Oh, yes, yes. That wasn't, that is in the, the story is in the book. And that that's interesting. I was working for ABC at the time, and as I said, we were ABC was get, just getting involved with cable television and other things, and they decided to produce uh, uh, a, a film for uh, the Arts and Tan Entertainment Channel, which they owned at the time, uh, about ballet. And I wrote the press release for it, and the producer just absolutely loved the press release. He called me, he was a very flamboyant guy, and he called me over to his office and he kissed me on both cheeks. He thought it was the greatest thing he'd ever read. And they sent out the press release and the press release was hugely successful. It got a lot of um, attention, including a, a, a big story in the New York Times art section, which is kind of like in the publicity world, that's like hitting a grand slam home run to have the New York Times write a big story about whatever it is you're promoting. So anyway, I was like hero for a day. And uh, the, the, the film itself, which was called, um, um, what was it called? It was about Giselle. It was Dancing with Giselle or something like that. But anyway, it, it was nominated for Best Documentary Feature uh, in the Oscar Awards. And the producer, who, as I said, thought I walked on water, said, well, you've got to write my acceptance speech for when I, when I win the award. <laughs> well, we were all, everybody was thrilled about the fact that we were nominated. And we had, we had this wonderful little party at a French restaurant in Manhattan where all the bigwigs of ABC, uh, Elton Rule and Leonard Goldenson and, and all the top executives at ABC were there. And little old me was there because I'd written this press release, you know, and it was just, it, it was just fabulous. But the damn film did not win the award, you know, so, so, uh, my, uh, my, uh, um, little speech was never, uh, was never read aloud, unfortunately, but I, I, gosh, it probably only took me about, 
it was it was a fifteen second speech and it only took about thirty seconds to write and they paid they probably paid me a thousand dollars so it, it it made for a funny story. Nice. I like that, <laughs> Richard. I just want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone should check out the site, check out the book, and uh, reach out and thank Richard personally. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much, Jeremy. It's I really enjoyed it. It was a good time. Thanks. Me too.